Take two, Carlton. <coughs> How old were you when you went to Vietnam, Mark? I was 20 when I went there the first time in 1966. Um, about the age I would have been if I'd been conscripted, but I wasn't conscripted. My marble didn't come out of the barrel, thank God. Then I went back again in 1970, and I was, what, 24? Had your impressions changed much in those four years? Yes. <laughs> A full 180 degree reversal. The first time I went there in 1966, I suppose I thought, like most Australians, that unquestioningly we should be there. You know, we should be in this war. That it was a just, sensible, and winnable war. And when I went there in 1974, I thought of, in 1970, I thought exactly the opposite. Were you able to get up on ABC television and say that? You mean get up and say this war is unwinnable? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. No. You wouldn't have lasted five minutes if you'd done that. They would have pulled you back uh, within a week of doing that. Did the ABC censor, censor you in any way? Yes, mostly indirectly. There's always that indirect pressure on you. But there were, there were examples of direct censorship as well. For instance, um, there was an official memo came out saying that uh, ABC journalists, whoever they may be, were not to use the word conscript. Uh, national serviceman was the phrase to be used. Uh, Enemy. The ABC was a, a conservative organization in that sense. They um, would refer to the word enemy all the time, which was not a very sophisticated way of discussing the political differences between the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. And so it was one blanket word, the enemy. And I asked why this word was used. And I was told because they were the enemy. So I asked whose enemy was it, whether the ABC's enemy or my enemy or, or whoever, and I would never, never got an answer to that, so they used the word enemy. With stuff that you sent back? Yeah, not in, obviously in the pieces I did to camera, but in the written copy you'd send back for radio and so on, yes. Mm. What do you think about the concept of objectivity in the ABC's claiming to have that? The ABC doesn't have objectivity, but I don't think any journalist does. The ABC has a very ill-defined concept of what it calls balance, which is quite harmful, in fact. It, it simply means that, uh, well, for example, uh, raving bomb-throwing lefties get a chance to put their point of view, and uh, raving fascist right-wing people get a chance to put their point of view. OK, that's OK as far as it goes, but it doesn't get anyone anywhere, because no conclusions are ever drawn. So television, did it really live up to its responsibility in changing the course of the war? Television didn't have a responsibility to change the course of the war. Television had a responsibility to present that war and show what it was like. It was the people who had to change the course of the war, if they wanted to, and eventually they did. It took television a long while to get around to providing the evidence which would allow them to judge that the war should be changed. Why did it take public opinion so long to change? I think it always does. Public opinion in Australia is, is, was about five years behind public opinion in America, and that was slowly changing. But I, um, I'd like to show you a phrase that I dug out before you came here, actually. For sure. Uh, from I dug it out of a book which I, which I had ready for you. It's a quote from the North Vietnamese Defence Minister, General Vo Nguyen Giap, who had a much clearer idea of the strength of, of Western public opinion than anybody else did. And he was writing this in 1950, and he said, uh, the enemy will pass slowly from the offensive to the defensive. Uh, the Blitzkrieg will transform itself into a war of long duration. Thus, uh, the enemy will be caught in a dilemma. He has to drag out the war in order to win it, and does not possess, on the other hand, the psychological and political means to fight a long, drawn-out war. Now, that was Jia writing in 1950 about the French. And he was right, and it pr proved um, equally correct uh, about the Americans and the Australians. Did television have anything to do with that? Hell yeah, that's what it was all about. Uh, the pictures of, of death and destruction, which appeared nightly at 7 o'clock or at 6.30, whenever, uh, changed people's minds. It didn't really matter what a journalist said or what James Dibble said when he read the news. Those pictures were there. How do you think television could uh, make people change their opinions sooner in future wars? I don't think it could. <laughs> it should, but I don't think it could. Possibly by television managements, uh, and I suppose this means the ABC, allowing far more freedom to their journalists on the ground, the journalist who's actually being shot at. 
who was actually interpreting the political situation, but the ABC didn't. They wanted it nice and conservative and safe. The ABC didn't mind talking about uh, the danger and the noise of the guns going bang and so on, because that's easy. But when it came to interpreting the political bits, ABC didn't want to know about it. What about the commercial stations? Were they any better? They very rarely sent correspondents to the war. They generally just relied on whatever came in from the agencies. Mm. Given this fact that uh, you were seeing a war but couldn't really report it as it was, did that really depress you? Some of the time, yes, and, and some of the time quite severely. When Richard Nixon began to pull out of Vietnam, he just he pulled out through Cambodia, you know, which, and um, that was enormously depressing because you could just see that this poor little Cambodia being dragged into this horrible quagmire. Now Cambodia had been there on the fringes of the Indochina War, but Nixon, you know, picked it up by the scruff of the neck and kicked it bodily into into the Indochina War. Let me give you an example of that. What was depressing when when that uh, invasion and it was an invasion, though, it's, you know, the ABC uh, liked to call it an incursion because it was a, a cleaner word. But when that invasion began, uh, we rode in, my cameraman and I rode in on top of uh, a column of American tanks. We drove across the border with these tanks. And the Cambodians were rather excited by this. Wow, you know, they were waving and saying hello and whoopee and all that sort of thing. Thing it all very exciting. They hadn't the faintest idea what was going to happen to them. And then the war went zip right across their villages and homes and rice fields and what have you. And when we came out on top of those tanks three days later, they weren't waving, they just weren't there. Mm -hmm. Can you relate to me uh, that incident with, uh, with Key? I suppose this was a dangerous incident. I, I suppose it was also a funny incident, black humour. When Air Vice Marshal Nguyen Khao Key, who I think at that stage must have been Prime Minister, this was in 1966, uh, donned himself in his baseball cap and his purple scarf and his pearl handle pistols and went down to uh, inspect the Australians at Nui Dan. And they sort of trotted him around and he sort of looked at things and said, oh yes, terrific, rubo, rubo. And they took him to a mortar detachment and they said, uh, Air Vice Marshal, would you like to fire a mortar bomb at the enemy? And he said, oh, terrific. So they um, gave him the bomb and he got it and he put it down the tube like that. And everyone sort of looked up to see where it was going and over there at the enemy, and it didn't. It went <whistles> boom and, and landed about three feet from the mortar, three feet from Key, and three feet from me. I didn't care what the hell what happened to Marshal Key. I was a bit worried about it myself. I just disappeared into a trench. A uh, half a dozen very solidly built Vietnamese jumped on top of Key and, and shielded him bodily from any explosion. It didn't explode, it just sat there fizzing, and then we sort of all emerged ten minutes later and nothing had happened. Were there any other ex frightening experiences you had while in Vietnam? That wasn't even, that was frightening at the time, it wasn't for real. There were a lot of frightening experiences. You were perpetually frightened when you're out in the field. I suppose the most frightening I ever had wasn't anything to do with combat at all. It was in a, it was in a bar, and I was just drinking there with the guy from Reuter. Uh, and most of the rest of the customers were Vietnamese. And we started to talk to the band, and a Vietnamese Air Force officer came up and pulled out a giant grade 45 or something, pulled back the hammer and put it to my temple like that and said, um, fuck off, white man. And he was drunk, you know, he didn't like white men in, in general and me in particular. And that is very frightening and you do tend to do what you're told. But that was nothing to do with the war. You know. I take it you uh, thought that withdrawal was the better part of uh, that? Yeah, right, yeah. And it generally was in most cases, you know, because um, I didn't really ever want to die for the ABC. Hmm. Sacrifice yourself for, for Talbot Duck Manton, you know. Do you develop an instinct when you're in a war zone? You have an instinct of self-preservation anyway, and it becomes very finely honed in a war zone. You tend to read the signs, where to go, where not to go. Uh, and that's just a matter of experience. Get a sense of uh, approaching catastrophe? Yeah, I suppose there's some sort of sixth sense. You, you can read the signs about you if things have suddenly gone quiet. Uh, if the peasants or the villagers or whatever have suddenly disappeared. Uh, um, Neil Davis, I suppose, uh, the Australian cameraman, would have the, f the most finely developed sense of that. He's the most experienced man I know, and very probably the most experienced journalist or cameraman who h uh, whoever worked in that war zone. What were your general impressions of Davis working with him? Davis was an enormously competent cameraman, a very brave man. Uh, 
he was a bit devil may care, like I guess we all were at some stage or another. But I, th I think Davis had a real commitment to taking pictures of that war, all the dirty, horrible, nasty side of it. And to do that, and to do it properly, he had to put himself into considerable danger, which he did far more often than anybody else I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did it with skill and with compassion. Even more so than frontline soldiers who regularly covered? Davis would have seen far more action than any soldier in Vietnam, yes. Would have been shot at more often, would have been in much more danger than any single soldier, I would think. Do mm. you think there's more risk for a cameraman and a soundman than a journalist? There's probably more risk for a cameraman because he has to take the pictures of the bang-bangs. Uh, the journalist has to be there to see him. He probably doesn't have to be quite as close. Take three. Yeah. The more risks involved. The more risks involved for a cameraman, soundman than for a journalist. Yeah, I think there are probably more risks for a cameraman because he's going to be there to take pictures of of the bang bangs. The journalist has to be there to see him. He doesn't have to be right there all the time. Uh, the poor old sound man gets the worst deal, or he did then with the equipment available then, because he's tied was tied to the cameraman by a cord, and the cameraman would see just what he was looking at through the, the eyepiece. Well, well, the equipment they used, was it very bulky or difficult to use? It's changed a lot, even over the last 10 years. The equipment then was fairly heavy. You had a big camera like this and a big shoulder harness, and you, uh, it's a lot lighter now. It would have been easier now to do. So it wouldn't have made it terribly flexible in terms of ducking for cover? No, not at all. <laughs> Can you... Uh, Give me an opinion on whether you think a cameraman should continue to film pain and suffering that he might be able to alleviate someone that's been wounded, or should he uh, help them? Uh, I don't know. It's a hard one. I th morally, yes, obviously, he should help alleviate the pain and suffering and, and forget the filming. But it didn't often work out that way, and it would depend who was in pain and suffering, I guess, to some extent. Uh, if it was an American or an Australian, it's a racist thing, and I'm being quite frank about this. If it was an American or an Australian, you would probably help him. If it was a Vietnamese, you'd say, ah, oh, yeah, there's another Vietnamese. And the reverse would apply. A Vietnamese would say, ah, oh, yes, it's just another white man. Uh, can you explain a little bit more why the cameraman should or should not continue to film? Well, you're getting into an enormous godlike moral judgment there. Is it better for the cameraman to show this pain and suffering to the mums and dads sitting at home in their lounge rooms? Is it more moral for him to help alleviate the pain and suffering? Probably, it's obviously, it's more moral for him to help alleviate it. But you just don't make those judgments. You really don't. It's such a, a black comedy, the whole, the whole war thing, that you just don't make them. Does that explain why cameramen, journalists, turned off to the pain and suffering around them? Yeah, you do tend to turn off a bit. Not all the time, but you turn off simply just to uh, stave off going mad yourself. It, it's a maddening experience. I mean, that in the most literal sense of the word, you can go mad looking at all those awful things happening. So you turn off. You just switch off your emotions. Mm -hmm. And that, that switching off shows itself in a very black, cynical, sarcastic humour. Uh -huh. Can you uh, tell me what you mean by the fear of the unexpected, the unknown? That was the most frightening thing about Vietnam, not sort of lying in a ditch while somebody sent bullets spitting over your head. You knew that was happening. You know, okay, you knew exactly where you were, what the situation was. The worst thing for me personally, it may be different for other people, was waiting for something to happen. You may be driving back uh, along a highway. Uh, and we used to go to war in this ridiculous old American Chevrolet, giant you know, 1958 Chevrolet, whatever it was. And you'd come back at just as dusk was coming down with nothing but empty paddy fields and quiet a village occasionally on either side of the road. And on one occasion, I, I remember passing the, the burnt-out shell of a car that had been hit by a, an RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade or something. And you were thinking, Christ, you know, the Viet, uh, the Viet Cong didn't have this bit of territory on the way out, but they could well have it on the way back. And that's when you were scared, just waiting for something to happen. The unexpected, right? The unexpected, yeah. Sense of impending doom. Can you tell me about uh, the time you were Davis in, uh, in Indonesia, how that exemplified a professional in the field? 
Davis was all, it wasn't a war in Indonesia. We were dealing with, say, rioting students or something. Davis had that, what the Americans call street smart sense, and I suppose you could use, also use the phrase combat smart. And we all developed it, but Davis had it more finely honed because he was more experienced. But you knew just when a situation was going to turn ugly, where to go if it did, uh, how to handle it if it did. But you, you basically tried not to get into that ugly situation of, of mob violence. Uh, if you did, you, you knew exactly when to depart, and Davis did know that. So if, all, if suddenly somebody had yelled out, kill the white man, we wouldn't have been there. You know. Vietnam was a long while ago, but it obviously had an effect upon you. Can you sum up for me how it changed you, made you a different person? Yeah, I just grew up in Vietnam. Market? Market. Take four, Carlton. <coughs> How did the, uh, you're right, Dave? Yeah, How did the uh, Vietnam War change you? I just grew up, you know, you'd see all these horrible things happening to you, and it was an experience never to be missed the Vietnam, never missed the Vietnam War. <laughs> no, quite seriously, it, it just made me grow up. You'd see all the man's, and this is not an original phrase, but you would see man's infinite capacity for inhumanity to man, and you learned a lot about that, and it changed you immeasurably. Is man's brutality, animal, animal instinct ever going to change? Yeah, I, I object to the phrase animal instinct, because animals, in fact, don't do that sort of thing to each other. That's <laughs> human instinct. Probably, I don't know. You're asking me for a very big question there. Probably not. It hasn't in the last million years. Why should it change from now on? Do you think that... Uh, can you make any comment about the enemy not being seen at all? And uh, like other places, you've got an established front line, but Vietnam was a guerrilla war where no enemy was seen. Yes, M most of the time you would not see the enemy in the sense that uh, great platoons of them would march over trenches as they used to do in the First World War. But it wasn't com all a guerrilla war by any means. Up north around uh, the demilitarized zone, it was a full-scale war and there were Vietnamese tanks and God knows what else coming at you. The fact that it was uh, mostly a guerrilla war though, did that make uh, people or soldiers indifferent to one another, to the enemy? and the journalists covering that war? Yeah, journalists were a little different, but to the average soldier, uh, yes, they were the enemy. Uh, and they were indistinct, faceless men, if you like. You know, they were just gooks, noggies, dinks to be killed. What about to the journalists? How did they regard the North Vietnamese Viet Cong? The journalists regarded them with a great deal of respect because they were very professional soldiers. They were and probably still are the best around. Uh, I don't know of any journalist who would have referred to them as the enemy, except perhaps people like American journalists like, say, Joseph Allsop, people like those. But I, uh, my friends and I, and, and no journalist I ever met, would say, uh, well, we better go out and cover the enemy now, or anything like that. There was no sense of that. Okay, cut.